Let's turn to where we left off last week. We'll go back to 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 through 25. And we'll read the text together, and then we'll pray, and then we'll break it down a little bit. John says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, Children is the last hour. And just as you've heard the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out. So it would be shown that they are all not of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father, and the one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. Thomas Brooks, the Puritan, said this, Satan promises the best, but pays with the worst. He promises honor and pays with disgrace. He promises pleasure and pays with pain. He promises profit and pays with loss. He promises life, and in the end, he pays with death, spiritual death. You might remember, we've covered this in the last couple weeks, you might remember that the apostles' instruction was to not have a love for the world, to not love the world system, nor are we to love the things in the world. So we need to hate the love of the world, actually. And John told us that if anyone loves the world system, that the love of the Father is not in that person. And he told us in verse 17, even last week, which precedes this morning's text, that the world is passing away. The world system is passing away. The cosmos is passing away. And all the lust within that world system is passing away with the world. And all those who love the world are passing away with it as well. All those who have been overtaken by the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, they're taken away. And he ends verse 17 by saying, it's only the one who does the will of God that lives forever. And we see in the, at the beginning of this narr- the next text in verse 18, he uses the word children again. And we spent a lot of time talking about children the last couple weeks. And we see here it's the only other time that he uses the same word for children that he did in verse 13. It's padion. And I showed you before that all over 1 John, all over it's technion, technion, technion for child, referring to a child with a term of endearment. It's my son or my child. And here's just a general word for child. So we saw that he's writing to the technion of God, verse 12, and then he mentioned a life stage, a stage of spiritual maturity in verse 13, a padion. And then he walked through these kind of uh, steps of parallel uh, maturity, physically in, in, a, in a child moving into a young adult moving into the father, and he uses that to show spiritual stages of maturity. So one is born again, they're a child of God, a technion, and then they become a child, a padion, and then they become a young person, and then they become a mature father and mother of the faith. So these spiritually maturing, and they spiritually in their maturing gain a stronger assurance of their salvation. And so why would John use, in verse 13, a general word for child, and here in verse 18, say padion again? It's the only other place he does. Because I believe what he's saying is, you might be a young child in your faith, you might be a technion, a saved individual, but you still need some instruction. You need biblical understanding. You are young in the faith, and being a young in the faith, you are at an immaturity level still. You need guiding care. Children who do not grow up are just like Christians who don't spiritually mature, and they remain kind of ignorant to the ways of the world. They they remain ignorant that there's false teachers out there, and at the same time, they're ignorant to what God's Word says about these things, and he's speaking to those individuals, even here, saying, listen, you you might be ignorant to certain things regarding the Word of God, therefore you are Padeon, and you're vulnerable, and you need to pay attention to what I'm saying. 
because you're up to be pulled the wrong direction. You're up to be vulnerable to the schemes of the evil one, spiritually speaking. So I believe it's in that sense that John starts this passage this morning referring to those who are immature in their faith, those of us that all still need to mature in our faith, calling on us believers to grow up a little bit and realize the thing we already know to be true. So the truth of these next few verses that we're going to unwrap right now is that we need some maturity. We all do. We need some instruction to help us discern, discern and judge what is good and evil, and especially when it comes to false teachings. Because we fall into the trap of saying every Christian so-called movie must be right, every so-called Christian song must be right, every so-called Christian teacher must be right, and people submit themselves, sometimes underneath false teaching in that. So here, I think he's saying, and I believe what he's saying is, you need to discern this, and you are Christ's, you are Christians. And what does Christian mean? Does anyone know? Yeah, I put it on the title. They're antichrists, and they're little Christs. And so you're a little Christ now, so you, you, you need to be aware that there are those that oppose Christ, even in the church. And there's, there's, there's those that are against Christ. There are antichrists. So this is the contrast that he's talking about this morning for our uh, maturity level to grow, to say there's God's anointed and there are Christ deniers. There are little Christs and there are antichrists. And we shouldn't be shocked. So let's look at number one, your outlines. Number one, your outlines is the Antichrists. And I believe it's going to show that they're going to go out. They went out according to this passage. Let's reread 18 and 19. Verse 18 says, children, Padion, it is the last hour. And just as you have heard that Antichrist is coming... Even now, many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. Verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. If they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out. So it would be shown that they're not all of us. So what he's saying is, children, Padeon, believers, you're young in the faith. You need to listen to the instruction. You need to grow up. You need to mature in your walk. You need to learn. There are teachings from the scripture you need to adhere to. There are things that you need to be strong about in the word. You need to move up into that young man of the word. Remember, we had those stages. The child moved into young adulthood, and they became strong in the word. And then they knew the schemes of the devil were out there. And why do we need to do this? He's throwing up the big red alert sign. Red alert, red alert. Be alert. Pay attention. Don't think like a child anymore. Why? It's the last hour. You're running out of time. There are those people in our lives that say, I'll think about Jesus later. I'm doing my thing right now. Maybe, you know, there's deathbed confessions. I've had a young man tell me that one time. Well, I could believe like the thief on the cross at the last moment. And I said, if that's your plan, that's a bad plan. You're running out of time. This is an urgent matter. John reminds the readers back then that he's writing to and through them to us sitting here. This is the last hour. This last hour is from the coming of Christ to his return. The last hour is the emphatic expression that encompasses Jesus' incarnation all the way through the millennial kingdom, all the way through final judgment. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 says, For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but he has appeared in these last times. It's the last hour when Jesus showed up. Why? For the sake of you. He came to save that which was lost. He came to take those that the Father was drawing to him. So you have to realize this is not new, just like those three things that we all could fall into, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. This is not a new thing. Satan has always been anti-God, anti-Yahweh. However, we can see that in the pages of Scripture, when Christ came, he ramped it up. When Christ showed up, the Creator lowered himself and became a man. The devil intensified his attacks. Since the birth of Christ, there have been many, many, many antichrists. And we always just think of Revelation. There are many, many antichrists. Anti just means against. And in some people's minds, it's in place of Christ. So this is a broad term. It's just saying anyone who opposes Jesus is an antichrist. And therefore, if you know of any false teacher today, even though they say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus all the time, if they're teaching a different gospel, they are antichrist. Now, we know in the end, in the book of Revelation, there is the capital A antichrist, but all those from the beginning of time to the end that are against him are anti 
Jesus Christ. Therefore, I think this is just a wake-up call for us, in a sense, to say, look, you can't stay immature. You become a believer, but it's the last hour. Don't stay immature. There's the gravity of the situation, the weight of the situation. Every day that we live is a little less of the hour left. When's Jesus Christ returning? Somebody got the number? Anyone? We don't know. And if you watch Fox News, you think it's like in a couple weeks. You don't know. But I know it's one day less. It's one day closer. So we understand this. The end is going to come like a thief in the night. It's going to happen. You're not going to be expecting it. You can't get prepared. That's why it's a poor decision to say, I'll just accept them later. I'll live and do what I want and sin, and the end I'll just get in. John says in verse 18b, just as you've heard, the Antichrist is coming. Meaning those who oppose Christ, they are coming. And we say it all the time. There's people that are going to attack the, 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 the teaching of Christ and the, the word about Christ and Christ himself and Christians too. And they're going to falsely teach Christians trying to pull them away from Christ. And the Gnostics at the time he was writing this were doing that very thing. Saying, look, Christ isn't the one who you think he is. He's an aberration. He's a, a ghost-like figure floating around. He can't be God and man because man is in a body and the body is evil. And God is spirit and the spirit is good. Therefore, he can't be the God man. There's a problem if you attack who Jesus is. Biblically speaking, then it's a false teaching. So the apostles warning, look, there's those antichrists going around, they're coming, and actually they've been in their own midst. They slander Christ, they falsely say things against what the word says about Christ, and then they get worse because the, all the culmination of the end is just reminding us, this is the last hour, this is why all these things are happening. This is why it's happening, because it's the last hour. Sadly, I believe that more people under the sway of the devil will take place under Christianity. On the 700 Club, on TBN, on uh, Air One or whatever, Scripture uh, Light, Christian radio stations. More people would, will be subverted to the teachings with a Christ name on it that are not biblical. More people will try to supplant Jesus and step into his place. More false teaching will come. And the Bible calls all these false Christ, false teaching, antichrist, and more is coming and more is coming. So we need to wake up and not just assume everything with the name Jesus. And it is okay for consumption and with our children and our grandchildren and our own life. Verse 18c, if you go back in that first verse, it says, Even now many antichrists have already appeared. They've already came. We received a letter from John, these people probably realized, and they should understand that they should not be ignorant to the fact that there's been all these antichrists already. And we would be foolish. We've been so far removed from when this letter was written that it's going to be better today. The word says they're going to come, and the word's telling you you in the church, even in Ephesus, he's telling us even now during our time that he's telling us we should not be surprised. We should know now because these things are happening, it is the last hour and the Antichrist at the end is going to come and this should mature us and this should wake us up and this should push us to say not only is the Antichrist coming in Revelation, he's already here and he's working through people. The Antichrists are already here, and they were already there, and the Gnostics were those. And he's saying many have appeared, and says in 18c, many antichrists have appeared. And the Gnostics are just one example of those false teachers. And why are they antichrists? They're, they're, they claim to be loving Christ, but they're decimating the biblical Jesus. Therefore, they're antichrists. So this is a good word for us. I think Never more than today are we bombarded because of the internet and because of the easy way that we can click on links and Google search and go to this site and go to that site and people are on Facebook and people are putting their opinions out. Everyone thinks they're Socrates of the Bible. And they're posting things and posting things and people are just consuming and consuming. And we need to be wary of the fact that Satan is using Antichrist to pull people away from the truth. And we need to Realize this is the last hour we're in. Antichrists are going to come. 
and Antichrist were there, and we could say today that we, we still are in the back half of the last hour, but we're still in the last hour, and that means more Antichrists have come, and they're going to come, and they're still going to come, and many, many, many will appear. And the apostle says with great confidence at the last part of verse 18, from this we know, we know for a fact that it is the last hour. It's showing that for us. And remember, he's keeping up his play on words. No, gnosko in the Greek. And the Gnostics said they were the ones to know gnosis. So they say they have great knowledge. They say they have a secret knowledge. They say they have an inside track. But you know because of these things that the word is accurate. The apostles using that word, gnosko, to know. In other words, the false teachers claim to have this knowledge, but you know it. And you know it because just look around. God has made it known to all of us that when we follow Christ, that he's the only way. And because he is the only way, he must be the God-man. He can't be what those Gnostics are saying that he is because that is not what the Bible says he is. He's 100% God, therefore he was able to live perfect life. He was able to fulfill the law and go to the cross as an innocent man. And at the same time, he was 100% man so he could take your sin and my sin and take it on his shoulders on the cross. So consequently, Jesus did could become the propitiation for our sin. And so the Gnostics are teaching and preaching. They're trying to do it for a reason. Satan's using them. Why? To pull men and women away from the faith. And why does Satan use false teaching? And it's not just all lies and all wrong. There will be some biblical text. There will be some things just slightly pull out of context. The truth is that we should see these things and say, yes, I know I'm saved in him and I'm secure in him. And I need to grow up and I need to realize this is the last hour. And it's not over. In fact, there are those teachers who had been in the church. They were trying to pull people away from Christ. And they wanted to destroy Christ's name. They wanted to destroy and spread lies and deceptions. And do you think that happens in churches today? Exactly. And then verse 19 says, We know that these false teachers were in there because they went out from us. Sometimes Christians use this text out of context to say every person that left your church, oh, they must be antichrist because they are not of us anymore. They're over there. That's not what it's talking about. It's saying false teachers don't hang around solid teaching. False teachers don't stick with it. They don't go to the end. They might come in. They might try and pick off a few uh, easy prey, you know, like if you watch the, the Nature Channel, the lion is not going for the front of the herd. He's going for the little one in the back or the sick one in the back. He's going to pick them off. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to come in and have an influence. They want to sabotage the ministry. They want to teach and promote lies and misunderstandings and, and throw a few grenades in the mix and mess up this and mess up that, and then they eventually will leave if it's a strong church because they're not really in the church universal. They're not in the body. The church is the body of Christ, and they're not part of the body. So it's not talking about an individual church. You left this church and went to that church. No. He's saying you believed in Christ with your mouth and then your life said at the end, I don't believe. And I'm, a, I'm not in. I'm out. The church is the bride of Christ. And all those who come in for a little bit and then they leave and they reject the faith, they're harlots. Verse 19, 19 goes on to say, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. They're not really, they weren't really a Christian. For if they had been of us, if they were really a Christian, they would remain with us. They would stay a Christian. It doesn't take much explaining to look at that. They have shown who they are because they didn't remain. And if they had to remain in the body of Christ, they would still be part of us still. It doesn't mean a local body. It means the body of Christ, the church. And if you're like me, I have a natural question when I read that. I start thinking, does God, why does God permit this? Why does God allow somebody to come in here and try and be a wolf in sheep's clothing? Why would he allow this false teaching to happen? Why would he permit uh, liars to come in and false promoters of the gospel that's false or antichrist? Why would he allow them to come into the assembly of God to begin with? Why doesn't he just keep them out? Well, I believe the answer is in the text as well. Because I think it's a kind of merge and purge thing. They come in, if there's false believers in there, they may go to the false teacher and they all may go. If the false teacher may try and do his thing and you thought he was a Christian and he shows he's not a Christian and he pulls out and proves it. God allows false teachers, God allows Antichrist to merge with the body of Christ at times to purge the body. So the second half of verse 19 says, but they went out so it would be known or shown that they're not of us. 
those who defect to faith, those who throw it away, you know them. There's some famous ones. They wrote books. You may have used their books, and then you realize they're, they've left their family, and they've went down a different lifestyle, and they've rejected the faith online. It's called deconstructing. So we, we know it's shown their true character comes out that they've rejected their place in the body because they never had a place. And so any time that somebody in your own life that you say they knew they were raised in a church and they went south and they went this way and they're far from God and they hate the scripture and they hate church and they hate everything about it, they probably were never a believer or they're rebelling and God's going to slam them and bring them back one or the other. But they're not a believer who's losing their faith because it's not biblical. They're showing their true character. They're tr- showing their unregenerate heart, the fact that they're lost because anyone can just say biblical things and teach biblical things. We know, right? We know that God causes all things to work together according to his will, right? And I believe that God permits Antichrist to do their evil propagating, to do their evil, sinful work within his bride to ultimately bring good to the bride, to purify the bride, and to strengthen us. We should not be like little babies still where we're just pulled by every wind of doctrine. We study the Bible. We grow in the Bible. We understand. So when somebody does does give a falsehood, we can reject it. When somebody is trying to pull us away from the text of Scripture, we see it and we don't go. Now, I'm not trying to minimize uh, the culpability. I'm not trying to minimize the responsibility of those evildoers, the Antichrist, those false teachers, because in, in the end, any person who's against Christ, Christ will be against them in judgment. That means every false believer, every false teacher, every Antichrist will experience the most severe eternal judgment if they remain there when they die, if they don't repent. And even they are not beyond saving. In Acts, you've seen it. Some of the preaching that Peter and those men did. The Jesus who you crucified, you can still turn to him. The one you killed can still be your savior. And some of us might, you know, say, well, this is doom and gloom. This is kind of scary. I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm a genuine believer, and I'm still a Padeon, so I'm immature in my faith, and I'm kind of tossed here and there, and I know he's writing this to me, and I fear the influence of false teachers. If somebody's t- saying something that's not right, and they're throwing Scripture around, I'm intimidated by that. I'm intimidated by antichrists who are coming, and I'm scared that there's still coming more of them. Does anyone in here fear that? You fear the influence of antichrists and false teachers. Those who are part of the sons of disobedience. Those who are part of the the children of wrath. I want to encourage you this morning that God's word assures us because we are children of God. We're technion, verse 12. If you're his child, he will never let you slip. He will always keep you on target. You may go up and down in your sanctification, but what he started with, he will finish because he's God and you're not. We will always stay true to our faith because we are his children, and that doesn't change. If you have a child and your child does something uncanny or embarrassing or even illegal or does something, he's still your child, isn't he? If he picks up a rock at Los Reyes and breaks somebody's window, he's still your child. If he steals the neighbor's mail and burns it, he's still your child. If he puts a roundup on the neighbor's lawn, he's still your child. God's word is our assurance. It is our hope that we cling to because it tells us that if you're his, his child, you cannot never be not his child. So don't fear this, but it, did, it, it should in, increase our desire to know more, the desire to understand the word more, so that we're not just tossed here and there by every wind of doctrine. So I believe, once saved, always saved, and what he started, he will finish. If you are justified, you will be glorified. If he's regenerated you, you will be glorified in the end. Turn with me to John 10. I just want to read this before we get to the next point. Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 27. And after I read this, you might keep a finger there for later. We'll come back to it. John, chapter 10, verse 27 through 30. Jesus is teaching here, and he says this, verse 27 through 30, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them. So if he gave you eternal life, you can't lose what he gave you. And they will never perish. That means they will never go to hell. They will never die spiritually. They will never enter hell. And no one, no one, no false teacher, Satan himself, no one can snatch them out of my hand. So how many people can take you away from the Lord? No one. 
Verse 29, my father who has given them to me, he gave them to the son, and the son says they're mine, they're not going to be taken out of my hand, and the one that gave me is the father, so he says, is greater than all. My father is greater than all, and no one's able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. So I'll just encourage you, when you think somebody's going to start pulling you the wrong way, when you think a false teacher is going to come in and just wreak havoc within the body of Christ, in this church even, do not fear anything but the Lord. The fear of man is conquered by the fear of the Lord, reverence for him, belief that you, he, you stand in the presence of somebody greater than you, more powerful than you, that has your soul and your end in his hands. And remember, it's the last hour. So in some sense, we have a great hope, but it's not time to play tiddlywinks. Do you guys remember that game, tiddlywinks? That was, that was a pretty great game, wasn't it? Just the name makes you smile. So we understand the Antichrists are coming. We understand they're already here. We understand they're found out because they go out, which takes us to number two. The, the anointed know something. The anointed know the truth, verse 20 and 21. And speaking of false teaching, when I read this, you're going to have some false teaching probably bouncing around in your head that you've heard even in Christian circles. Verse 20 says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. So the anointed ones are those that are saved, those that are little Christ, the Christians. They have an anointing from the Holy One, which is God. And charisma is the word for anointing, and charisma in the Greek has been misused. Can you think of some terms? Charismatic teaching, charismatic movement. They take that word and they bring the false notion of the Holy Spirit working in one's life and they propagate a false teaching with the biblical words. But we always say context, context, context. Biblically speaking, the context here is literally salvation. It's salvation. You actually could say, but you have been saved by the Holy One. You've been granted salvation from the Holy One. So all this false notion of what the Spirit could do in a special way is not what's taught here, and all those who are saved must be regenerated by the Holy Spirit. So we understand that. We understand there are no higher levels of Christianity. Uh, there, there are those who say you're, you're born in Jesus, and you become a believer, and then later on you get the Spirit, and then you're baptized in the Spirit, and you reach a whole other level. Oh, no, that's right. There are no hierarchy. There's no levels. You're not the super Christian. You've been baptized more than one time, so now you hit the next level. No, you become a believer. You've been regenerated by the Spirit of God with the Word of God. Your heart was softened because it was hard and was dead, and therefore you now realize your sin. And then you can repent. And then you can submit in faith to Christ as your Lord and Savior. And then you're sealed with the Spirit because that alone is how you were saved. And that is when you are dwelt with the Spirit at salvation, simultaneously regeneration, repentance and faith, and indwelling happens all in a single solitary moment. And John has said this many times, therefore Christians get all the Spirit all the time. And you got it all at the same moment, not a little bit added over time, a little bit more of the Spirit, a little bit more of the Spirit. No, all at the same time, and every true believer has all the Spirit all the time. So this word anointing was charisma, literally meant anointment or to place oil, and at various times it was used in the Old Testament, in particular even in the New Testament, to talk about somebody being set apart. It was a sign of an assignment, assigning something to, onto someone. So in this text, when it refers to anointing from the Holy One, this is setting apart as an assignment, and figuratively speaking, the Holy Spirit comes upon you, softens your heart, you exercise faith, and He indwells you and takes up residence in you. Therefore, every Christian who is anointed with the Spirit of God, the Spirit is like the oil. He's setting you apart. It's figuratively speaking with a spiritual way. Instead of anointing someone with oil, we've been anointed in our soul by the Spirit. He is the ointment, and he is the assignment that puts, gets placed on us to show us whose we are and who we are. Other parts of Scripture say that Jesus comes into us by his Spirit, right? So it's not like you have Jesus and then you get something else. It's the Godhead. There's the Father. There's the Son. There's the Spirit. It's the same thing when we say, Jesus has came into my life. How did he come into your life? How did Jesus come into your heart? Via his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that's God comes in. So there are those out there that teach. When you get an anointing, and I've heard the anointing language all over the place, I have an anointing. You have an anointing. I saw you speak. You have an anointing. Yeah, I don't think you're using those words as the Bible uses them. 
Because what they mean is, I have another level. What they mean is, I have a special anointing. What they mean is, I have a special gift. What they mean is, there's a special place. But again, Jesus and the Word and the Father and the Spirit, they don't teach that. They don't show us that. The Father God wills and draws and intends to save us through his Son. And then the Son of God purchases and redeems the sinner. And then they become saved because of his cross work. And then the Holy Spirit, who softened your heart to begin with, indwells you. Ephesians chapter 1, you remember that? So I think maybe just to help you better understand what I'm saying, biblically speaking, I think another way to look at this is Jesus was the Christ. Remember that? That's not his last name. And thus not his middle name, Jesus the Christ. No, Christ is a title, and it meant Messiah. And Messiah in Christ literally meant, here it comes, the anointed one. The anointed one. Therefore, in a similar fashion, I believe if you think about it this way, the word behind those who are assigned with him, those who have been regenerated by the Spirit, indwelt by the Spirit, exercise faith in Christ. Jesus is their Christ. He is the anointed one. He is their Savior. And those who are saved by him, you're little Christ. You're the lesser anointed underneath the greater anointed of God. So that's another way to think about it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 and 22 says this, Now he who established us with you in Christ and anointed us is God who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. That's us. The anointed one of God placed you into being anointed. And this is not a special gift. This is talking about salvation. And so when we read this, we understand this. This should bring some weight to us. This should cause you to pause. The Bible uses all kinds of language. This should cause you to pause, but it doesn't at times because we're still on. We're children. But when you're called an ambassador of Christ... When you're called, you're a little Christ. When you're called the children of the Most High, light into the world. We have been given an anointing from the Holy One. And now Christ, we're supposed to be him in the world. We're supposed to be his representatives out there. And guess what? If he got opposition from Antichrist, and we're not, uh, we're not Christ ourselves, but we're little Christ. We reflect him. We're the moon. He's the sun. We reflect him. We show him outwardly, we live for him, we're his disciples, we're his followers, we're his representatives on earth. Guess what those entities that want to usurp him, that want to go against him, are going to do to us? The same thing. So we know, and we believe that the Antichrist have been, and they have been among us, and they are coming in the future, and at the end, they will come all the way to the end, and we understand that they're going to be confronting who Christ is, confronting the body of Christ. If you want to see any false teaching out there, See what they believe about Jesus, and you'll find the answer, why they're false. So if there's Mormons that say, or Latter-day Saints, they call themselves today, LDS, if they say we're brothers and sisters in Christ, no, we are not. We are not the same. Verse 18a says, why is this important? Why is this weighty? Because it's the last hour, and you've heard the Antichrists are coming, and they've already came. Verse 19 at the end says, but they went out to show they're not of us. Then verse 20 says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, so you should know this. And there it is again. I think John is specifically pointing to those Gnostics that were in that congregation, that were in that realm of that world system, in those churches, trying to wreak havoc. And he's saying, this should not be surprising to you. You've already been dealing with the Gnostics. And you've already seen them go out. They've left. And you should know this, and you should understand this, because you've been set apart. You've been anointed with an assignment. And it came from the Holy One, which is God. And it set you apart. And you should know this. Gnosko. You should know this as a settled hope in your heart. And there's times where my kids would go to school and they would say, so-and-so is acting this way. And I would say, are they believers? No, they don't go to church. Well, then they're acting how they're supposed to act. What did you do? Uh, We understand there are those outside these walls. Maybe they're in your family at, at home. Maybe they're in your extended family. There are people that are underneath the sway of the evil one. Go read Psalm 73 before you go to bed tonight and you'll see. It appears that they just have it all, but in the end they're going to be swept away by a sudden terror. It's the last hour. Those people underneath that the sway of the evil one, the false teachers, and those who follow them, the schemes of the devil, they're trying to snuff out Christ, and they're anti-Christ, they're against Christ, and those people are caught up in it. And their doom is sure if they stay in it. 
And we understand that there's conflict. When you have conflict with somebody else, you're like, well, I don't want to cause conflict. I'm not going to judge them. I shouldn't judge them. I'm not going to judge them. Well, if they want to do something that's not in God's word, you can't do it just to appease them. If somebody wants your kids to be involved in something that you know is not right, don't do it just to not cause waves. Because oil doesn't mix with water, just like false teachers, antichrists, don't mix with those anointed of Christ, the little Christ. And if, if you do stand on the word, and you do stand who, you're, who you are as a Christian, they may leave. But then that's God's will, that they leave. So it says, you, Gnosko, this, you know this. This should give you a great settled hope in your heart. Not to fear what's out there. 21a said, I've not written to you because you don't know the truth. And I can even say, I'm not preaching this to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it's why I'm preaching to you. Those people did know it's why he was writing to them. He's using a little reverse psychology here. He's saying, look, I didn't write to you because you don't know. I'm writing to you because you know. Well, then why are you writing it? They already know. Because they need to be reminded. They need to grow in that truth. And so do we. So do you and so do I. Because if you know the truth in here and in here, and the truth of God is the absolute truth, then you will spot falsehood. You will spot things you shouldn't do. Your, your own mind, your own conscience, the warning bells will go off. And so this is telling us, yes, you understand who you are. Yes, you know that. But you need to live on that knowledge. You need to gain godly wisdom from that knowledge. And you need to be able to spot a false teachers. If you have somebody, you shouldn't be afraid to read a book that has false teaching in it if you know the word. Because it will be flashing on its page. This is wrong. This is wrong. I'm not suggesting you do this, but I read some of Bill Johnson's books, who is the pastor at Bethel in Reading. And it was just flashing everywhere. I ran out of highlighter. I ran out of pen. Saying, no, wrong, wrong. Disagree, not true, not true. You know how they train people to find counterfeit money, right? We've, we've talked about this, I think, before. Do they train them by bringing them in false bills? Here's a fake grant. That's the 50. Here's a fake grant. Can you see what the problems are? What do they do? Somebody give me a 50. I'll show you. No. <laughs> I'll hang on to it till later. They, they get the real thing. They, they know how the real thing feels. They know how it feels when it's crumpled up. They know how it feels when it's real. They know how it feels, how it looks when they hold it up to the light. They know what it looks like if it's been even written on. They know what the pen looks like, if the ink is on it. They know everything about it. They know how it smells, how it feels, what it looks like, everything about it. So if a fake one gets in their hand, they don't need to be told it's fake. They know. And that's what we need to do with the Word of God. And he's trying to tell them, and, he's, and in a way he's telling us, that there's this thing out there called the law of non-contradiction. It's not a theory, it's a law, because it's true. The law of non-contradiction says two things that oppose each other and claim to both be right can't both be right. So this one can be right, and this one's wrong. Or this one is right, and this one's wrong. Or they're both wrong. They never can both be right because they're opposite to one another. So therefore, there's a law of non-contradiction. And the apostle's saying in the closing verse, he's explained to them the same truth of the law of non-contradiction. He says, because no lie is of the truth. Because a lie and a truth break the law of non-contradiction. And you can use that same thing with people who believe another gospel, another religion. And they just say, you believe what you want to believe, and I'll believe what I believe, and we'll all see you in heaven together. No. Two things in opposition to one another that claim to be both true can't both be right. So John says it by saying, no lie is of the truth. And so we saw the Antichrists are coming, and they're already here. And if they're found out, they go out. And the anointed ones of God, those that are saved, they know the truth, and they're set apart with that truth. And their little Christ and the Antichrist are against God's anointed as just like they're against Christ. But we know we're his to the end. Takes us to number three in your outlines. The Antichrists, they deny the Son and the Father. They deny the Son and the Father. Verse 22, it says, who is the liar? Then he gives the definition. But the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. 
You want the def- definition of a spiritual liar? They deny that Jesus is the anointed of God, the Messiah. Then it goes on to say, that person, this is the Antichrist. The one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son on the other side of the spectrum has the Father. So what he's teaching them and teaching us through them is that the little Christ, those that are anointed by the Holy One, those that are saved, they're technion of God, you're a Christian, you're a child of God, you have the knowledge because you've embraced the truth. And the living Word of God and the Spirit of God have brought you to the truth. However, the Antichrist, they don't embrace the truth. They follow what? Lies. They follow lies. They believe lies. They teach lies. And they try and pull people away to a lie. If Jesus is the embodiment of truth, then those that are against Jesus are the embodiment of lies. And what is one of Satan's names? The father of what? Lies. So in essence, you see in verse 22b that the person is a liar if they're the one that denies that Jesus is the Christ because that is the truth. And he clarifies this and he drills down further by saying that person, that person who's denying that the Father and the Son are who they say they are, denying that Jesus is the anointed of God, the Messiah, the Christ, that person or any person that denies Jesus, that person's a liar. And they are indeed an antichrist. And he says in verse 22, part C, this is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. That's putting a name on it. That's labeling that person. If they're always going against who Jesus is, then they're anti-Jesus. If they're always against going the truth, against the truth, then they're full of lies. One preacher put it like this, a right view of Jesus Christ, his person, his work, his saving message, that is an essential mark of genuine saving faith. So if you believe that and you hold to that, then you're saved by that. Because no one is saved who rejects the biblical revelation about Christ. If you say you're saved but you reject who he is that the Bible says, then you're not saved. And I don't care how many times you walk forward, I don't care how many times you were dunked in water, you are not saved if you reject or you don't embrace the truth of who Christ is from the Bible. Jesus Christ, unfortunately in today's Christianity, has been relegated to a self-help guru. And their sermons are like five ways to help your marriage. Three ways to have a, a better parent-child relationship. Six ways to uh, you know, retire in your golden years with character. Jesus is not a self-help guru. God is not a cosmic vending machine. We just punch the right buttons, put some money in the plate, and down comes what we want. He's not a lucky rabbit's foot. He's not a magic potion. There are people that use him for everything like he's just there to assist us in our life to make our life better. No, we must embrace him as the anointed Messiah of God. That's what he's saying. You have to grow up in your understanding of who this is that you worship. John 8, 24, Jesus said himself, Therefore I said to you, you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am he. You will die in your sins. That's Jesus' words, not my word. I had somebody ask me one time, if I don't believe in Jesus, are you telling me I'm I'm going to hell? And I said, I'm not telling you that, but God's word does tell you that. And sometimes if somebody asks you that at a dinner table, you don't really want to answer when there's 10 people around the dinner table, do you? So are you saying I'm going to hell? Is that what you're saying? All the forks stop, no one's eating. Jesus said that. He is the truth embodied, therefore we must obey him. And he's the truth, and the gospel is the truth regarding him. And therefore, it says in verse 23a, whoever denies that truth, the son, that he's the son of the father, he's denying the father too. Because the Jews were going around doing that very thing. Well, we understand Yahweh, but we don't believe in you, Jesus. So they denied the son, which meant they were denying the father who they worshipped. So we understand salvation is by faith alone. We understand that salvation is found in Christ alone. We understand that it's found in God's word alone, the scriptures, the truth alone. And that is the anointing that we've received. And it's our only hope. It's our only way we're set apart as a believer. It's the thing that we know that's true. But what I have to ask, because there's a few of us in the room, is this morning, is that you? Are, Are you denying Christ a little bit? Are you denying Christ full stop? You're denying that Jesus is the Christ. You're denying that he's the Messiah. You're denying that he's the anointed of God, the Savior of the world. If that's you this morning and you've pushed back against him, realize that if you deny the Son of God, maybe you're Jewish and you deny the Son of God, but 
in doing that, you're denying Father God. And you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit God. And you're rejecting the Word of God. So my heart is, if that's you this morning, that you need to listen to what this is saying in the last part of verse 23. It's a challenge for you. It strengthens us believers. It moves us into maturity. But if you're not a believer, this is a challenge for you. You have to do something. Who knows the difference between preaching and teaching, besides some men that I know? What's the difference between preaching and teaching? Teaching is giving you information. Preaching is calling for you to do something. So I'm standing up here today saying, if that is you, I'm calling you by the challenge of this passage that you need to do something. If there are those in you in this room that are Christians, I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, most of us are Christians, we need to remember this verse as well, this last part of the verse. So it should challenge the non-believer, it should be a reminder to the believer, verse 23b says, the one who confesses the Son has the Father also. There are many people that believe in God, but they don't want to believe in Jesus. That's a problem. And realize, if you're against Christ, just like those false teachers, if you're against Christ, then you're denying the Son of God, and at the same time, your denial is denying the Father God. Go back to chapter 10 of John that we read a little bit earlier, and we pick up at verse 25. John 10, verse 25, Jesus answered them and said, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. Verse 26. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep, my followers, my little Christ hear my voice. And I know them. I know them intimately. And they follow me. And I give eternal life to them. And that means they will never perish and he, then what we read earlier, and no one will snatch them out of my hand, and my Father's given them to me, and he's greater than all, and no one's going to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. If you are willfully denying Christ, I beg you to reconsider your decision. If you're going away from Christ and running from him, if, if he wants you, he's going to get you. I pray that you would turn to him. Please do not believe the lie of Satan that there are many ways to heaven. There are not. There's one road, and it's very narrow. It's hard to find. There's a little tiny gate and you have to pass through that gate, and it's like going to Disneyland through the turnstiles. Have you ever tried to take two people at once through a turnstile? It doesn't work. I barely fit through there with I'm one person. It's one at a time. You don't go on someone's back. You're not going to tell them, my parents believed in you so much. My wife believed in you so much. My husband believed in you so much. Few find that narrow path. Few go through Christ as a gate. And so if you're denying him and you're pushing him back, I'm asking you, I'm praying you, you need to do something. You need to cry out to him for mercy and beg him to let you find the path. And if you're a believer, we need to be reminded of these things so that we don't listen to false teaching and we don't follow those who deny Christ and the Father. That brings us to number four. Number four in your outlines is the anointed abides in the Son and the Father. So he says in verse 24, John goes on to say, as for you, flipping to the other side of the coin for a minute, let that abide in you, which you have heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. So he's saying, as for you, he's saying, look, as a Christian, those false teachers who are denying, they're non-Christian, and I'm saying to you, as a Christian, as for you, the one who has the anointing of the Holy One that's been saved, as for you, you're a little Christ, as for you, the believer, as for you, the Christ follower, let that underline that if you want, abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. And we'll talk in a minute what that is. But first let's talk about what you've heard from the beginning. Go back to 1 John chapter 1, the first three verses. John's on topic still. He wrote this. We dissect the passages and we look at things over a whole year and many months looking through the word. But this was one letter written with one kind of idea. And you can't miss to catch what he's saying in verse 1 of chapter 1 of 1 John, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning what? The word of life. Who is that? Jesus. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us because Jesus came down to us and walked with those men. Verse 3, what we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. 
So I think you need to realize if you're a Christian, you cannot lose your salvation. You cannot fall back from obeying the word of God. You do at times in little instances, but not fully. You're not going to fully reject him and fully go out from the assembly. A Christian can't lose what he did not earn. A Christian can't lose the spirit which he was being, the spirit was given to him. He can't lose what he didn't earn. He can't get rid of what God is buying. He can't give back what God has purchased. Who likes birthday gifts and you like them to put the receipt in there because you really don't like what they picked? There's none of that. You're not taking this back. He's a guarantee. He sealed you. You're in. But however, we talked about this morning, you could quench the spirit. You could shut him down. You know one of his things he does is he illuminates this to you? Well, we can do this. Nothing to illuminate. We can, we can shut him down a little bit in our life. We can grieve him because we don't do what we're supposed to be doing. We're not in this. We're not praying. We're not falling. We're disobeying. And we could grieve him and we could quench him and we could not be walking with him. We could not be being led by him, being filled by him. We need to remember, though, what John is exhorting his audience to and what he's exhorting to us through them is to say, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. And what is the that? The that is the truth about the gospel of Christ. The, the one gospel of the one Christ, that is the truth. That is God's word. We're Christians because of that one truth, and we're growing and maturing in Christ because of that one truth, and we're given more and more assurance of our salvation because of that one truth. And then in the same vein of thought, he's saying, look, I'm telling you, you need to pursue this more and more. You need to be preserved in this truth and pursue it actively every day. This is the truth that you've been handed your salvation through. Why would you not want to grow in it more and more? Why would you not want it to help you not be pulled in a different direction? Because you don't know, because you're ignorant to that. Sometimes in my prayer life, and I suggest you do the same, I pray for what I know I did, and sometimes I said, Lord, and then I repent and ask you to help me for the things I don't even know because I'm ignorant. Because I guarantee you the list you know is not the whole list. We have to be sanctified. We have to be set apart. Our assignment is now we're little Christ. We're set apart from the world system. We can't love the world system anymore. We're set apart from Satan. We're not under him anymore. We're not locked with chains to our sin anymore. But there are those that are against Satan, against, with Satan and against Christ, and they're antichrist. And we are children of God, and they are children of wrath, and they're going to come into attacking each other at times. And so it should make you run to the word and run to God. You have to move out of being an infant. Yes, you're born again. Praise the Lord. But then you have to move into childhood. And then you have to learn more. Move into young adulthood and have the word more. And then you move into fatherhood, spiritually speaking. And Jesus is just telling you, keep moving. I am with you. I am in you. I am the Lord. John 8, 31b, Jesus said this, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. If first class conditional means because you continue in my word, then you're my disciples. That's not a question. And here in verse 24b, there's another first class conditional. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you. If it's like, okay, well, if it doesn't abide in me, it's not true. It's not saying that. He's saying because. The result of something if and then, if and then, if and then, it's because the result of something, because you heard from the beginning, because the truth of God abides in you, then you will abide in the Son of God and the Father God. And what is the end game? What's the result? Where, where does all this come to a flourishing? What's the final finish line for you? What's the final finish line for the church? What's the thing that we've heard from the beginning. What are you as a little Christ, what are you as a Christian promised in the end? When the last hour is wound down, when you stand at the judgment seat and the last second of that last hour takes off, Verse 25 tells us this is the promise. This is the end game. This is what it's all about for you, which he himself made to us eternal life not so you can just live forever and play a harp on some cloud in heaven forever no so you can worship him and praise him and be with him and he will be your satisfaction he will be all that you need 
We're known by him, and we know him, and that faithfully runs its course and concludes with eternally being with him. To get back to what was ruined in the garden when Satan deceived Eve. Eternal life, we get the living bread. John 6, verse 53 through 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. Now, he's not talking about transubstantiation in Roman Catholicism. He's not talking about the host and he coming literally into the wafer and into the juice of the wine. No, he's not talking about that. He's saying, if you're mine and you're following in communion and celebrating that I'm yours, your Savior, making you anointed of God, and you've, you, you've in essence had my flesh and my blood cover you in your sin, that he who eats the flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him, that person, up on the last day, when the last hour is over. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me. He's spiritually speaking right here, not cannibalism. And every Sunday, Jesus doesn't have to be crucified again and sacrificed again and again and again while you live a life of sin in between. He says, I am in the Father and he is in me as the living Father sent me. I live because of the Father and he who eats me, he also will live because of me. And this is the bread which came down from heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. Not the manna, not the mushroom substance that grew out of the ground. No one knew how it got there. God put it there and they ate it. He's like, no. They ate it and died. I'm talking about the one who eats this bread lives forever. Because you've been anointed by the Holy One. You've been saved and secured for the, your spot at the table. As one theologian put it, the contrast between Antichrist and Little Christ is absolutely clear. Antichrist deny the faith. Antichrist depart from the faith. Antichrist seek to deceive the faithful of the faith. And on the other hand, on the other hand, Christians affirm the faith. Little Christ remain in the faith to the end, and little Christ are not deceived by falsehood because they're born of the truth. So we understand as we see this passage this morning that the Antichrists are coming. Don't be shocked. They are already here. They will be found out. Don't worry. God has control. They will go out. Just don't follow them. You're the anointed. You're the little Christ. You know the truth. The truth has been set in you, and you've been sealed by the Spirit, and now you know the truth and you're set apart in the truth and therefore you follow the truth and don't follow the lies. And if you don't understand what the lies and the truth are, then that's when you're in this more and you're praying more and you're coming to studies and you're trying to understand and the Spirit starts showing you, illuminating these truths to your life and they give you security. And when somebody's doing a lot of this or writing a lot of this, you say, that is not right, that's not what the Bible says. And then three, the Antichrist deny the Son, and by denying the Son, they deny the Father. And finally, the anointed, the believers, they're true believers, they're little Christ, they abide in the Savior, and by abiding in the Savior, they abide in his Father, Father God as well. So in the end, all who are little Christ, all who are Christians, all those who are true believers will remain faithful to the end, and their salvation is secure, and it's sure, and when the final gavel drops, in judgment, they will inherit the kingdom of God. And they will be living out eternal life with him forever and ever, doing what he created us to do. And these who are with him, they will never see darkness again. And if there's anyone here this morning who does not know him, has not trusted him, only is against him, only wants what they want, they, if they end that way in their life and they hear the gavel drop, they will never see light again. There will only be darkness and gnashing of teeth. So my admonition to you is to ask yourself, what about myself? Am I God's anointed or am I a Christ denier? Am I a little Christ or am I Antichrist?